Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's April 28th, 2020, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. Today we discuss how to take photographs of wild animals without harassing, exploiting, or harming them. In other words, today we're taking a look at ethical wildlife photography. To help us delve into this topic, we welcome environmental journalist Annie Roth, who recently wrote an in-depth article for Hackeye Magazine exploring how wildlife pay the price when humans get too close in order to snap a few pics that they hope will score them some likes on social media. We also speak with professional wildlife photographer Susie Esterhaus about her own experiences in the field, her specialization in taking photos of baby animals, and why she says patience is perhaps the most important best practice, not just for photographing wildlife in an ethical manner, but for capturing the most unique and compelling images. It's kind of a win-win because, number one, where you're treating the animal with kindness and respect, and we're not affecting their lives in a, in a very negative way. And number two, we're getting very unique gifts out of it. We're getting these, these incredible images that we wouldn't be able to get without it. As the world has gone into lockdown in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, a number of stories about wildlife returning to now empty city streets have gone viral online. Some of those stories were hoaxes, unfortunately, such as the dolphins that had supposedly returned to the canals of Venice. But it is true that coyotes have been spotted roaming the streets of San Francisco, and that goats have taken over the streets of a town in Wales, and that mountain lions have been observed in Boulder, Colorado. For professional wildlife photographers, as well as amateurs and hobbyists, snapshots of wild animals like these can draw massive attention on social media networks. But of course, the best wildlife photography doesn't capture animals tentatively exploring newly human-free environments. Truly captivating images show wild animals in their natural environment. Going out and disturbing animals in their wild habitat can go drastically wrong for both the animals and human photographers, however. And it's nearly impossible to tell how any given photo you see on Instagram may have been taken. Yeah, so when you look on social media, it's actually super difficult in some cases to identify what's ethical and what isn't. When there's not a lot of context, you can just look at a photo of, say, a tiger in the woods and you're like, that's gorgeous. And you just assume it's a wild tiger. But if you actually spoke to the photographer, you would learn that's a captive tiger and you have no idea how it's being treated. Annie Roth is a freelance journalist whose Twitter bio specifies that she covers the wildlife beat. Roth recently wrote an article for Hackeye magazine that not only looks at how to do wildlife photography ethically, but also provides numerous examples of how not to do wildlife photography. I had seen a lot of unethical wildlife photography and just wildlife photography on social media, and I saw how much traffic these kind of photos would get. It's a huge thing on Instagram, particularly. When you just go to scroll through like the most popular posts of the day, there's always photos of animals. And I decided to write this story after seeing Ocean Ramsey's um, I guess you could call it a stunt. Ocean Ramsey is owner of the Hawaii-based dive charter company One Ocean Diving, and also an Instagram influencer and outspoken advocate for shark conservation. In January of last year, Ramsey made international headlines when she published photos of herself swimming with and touching a nearly 20-foot-long great white shark that experts later said appeared to be pregnant. Because as soon as it went up online, all these scientists just immediately started giving their take on why they thought it was unethical. And as a science reporter, I get a lot of stories from studies and reports, but I also get a lot of stories from Twitter. When I see scientists are mad about something, I pay attention. So they seem particularly mad about this stunt. And I start speaking to scientists about, like, why is this so bad? She touched it with her hand. You know, is that putting the shark in any danger? Because... To someone who doesn't really understand this, it doesn't seem that harmful. She touched a shark a couple times. She certainly didn't attack it or hurt it. How can that be unethical? But the more I learned about shark biology and the way animals react to our presence, I learned how much of a lasting impact forcing an interaction on an animal can have. Roth explains what's at stake in such a human-wildlife interaction. You can say it's a blanket statement. Animals don't really want anything to do with us. If a wild animal comes up to you, 99% of the time it's been habituated, which means humans have been feeding it, whether legally or illegally, and that poses a lot of problems for wildlife. As I said in my piece, most animals see humans as predators, whether they're larger than us or not. 
we're a different species and they don't know how we're going to treat them if we interact with them. So when you approach a wild animal, it's going to be scared. Whether it thinks it can fight you away or run away, that's really up to the animal. But both responses have a very high energetic cost. If I go up to a buffalo, I'm going to say I'm in Yellowstone, if it runs away, it's spending energy to run away. If it charges me, it's spending energy to charge me. And energy is a very costly commodity in the animal kingdom. You have to find food every day. You have to avoid predators. You have to find habitat. And all these things cost energy. And if there's this interaction that happens between a human and an animal that takes up all your energy for the day, you have less energy to spend on avoiding predators, finding food, mating, all these essential activities that animals need to do to survive. So in the case of Ocean Ramsey, she was forcing an interaction on a shark that was attempting to feed on a whale carcass, and she ran the risk of scaring that shark away from the whale carcass. And I don't think I need to explain that a whale carcass is like a jackpot for a shark, especially a white shark. They spend so much time in the open ocean looking for food, and the open ocean is can really kind of be like a marine desert. In some places, there isn't a source of food for them for hundreds of miles. So to risk scaring it away from such a great food source does pose a threat to the animal's well-being. Unethical practices aren't only a problem amongst amateur photographers, Roth discovered. Even professionals can engage in questionable behavior to get a good shot. Absolutely. When people are really getting into wildlife photography, you can call yourself an amateur, it's a lot easier to get away with um, unethical behavior because less people are watching you and you know you are probably not making money off of this and you have less people to answer to. But professional photographers do this all the time and it's really hard to spot in some cases. Um, take for example, a nest and den photography. So I've seen gorgeous photos of uh, bears and uh, hedgehogs and foxes curled up in their dens and it looks absolutely wonderful. They're so cute and they look so cuddly. But the reality of those photos is someone went and found their nest, removed part of it and stuck a camera through it. And we don't know how those things ended. Even if they put the material back, now the nest smells like humans. What if the mother of the baby in that den doesn't want to come back because it smells differently? Or what if it's not as insulated? It's, there, there's just so much context that needs to be explained for so many photos. So even if you take a gorgeous photo in it of an endangered species and people are like, I didn't know about this species, I didn't know it was in danger, thank you for bringing this to light. The photo itself could be problematic and you don't have any way of knowing unless the photographer discloses the details of how he or she captured that photo. And that's pretty rare. It's rare in the industry to have photographers disclose every detail of what went into the photo. And that's what creates problems, especially on social media where captions aren't very long and most people are just looking at an image and scrolling right past and not asking questions or reading the caption. Social media, much like photography, can be a powerful tool for raising awareness about the plight of wild animals that are in need of conservation attention. But social media also drives a lot of the problematic photography that Roth reviewed for her article. It's not that being a wildlife photographer on social media is an instant get-rich-quick scheme. There's definitely tons of photographers who don't have very many followers at all who post wonderful images. The stuff that reaches the top of social media is the evocative content. And that's why there's kind of a competition between these up-and-coming influencers and wildlife photographers to get that evocative content, to show they have access to animals that most people don't. The exotic, the scary, these are the animals that get the clicks. So by showing you have access to these animals and can interact with them in a way that other people might think is brave or scary or unique, that's how you get all the clicks. Can clicks be used to garner attention towards conservation issues? Absolutely. Social media has a lot of power to educate the masses and get their attention. Take the video of the sea turtle with the straw up its nose. Roth is referencing the viral video shot by marine conservation biologist Christine Figener of Texas A&M University, who led a research team that found a male olive ridley sea turtle in Costa Rica with a plastic straw wedged firmly in its nostril. The video showing the scientists removing the straw has been viewed nearly 40 million times. 
that video took social media by storm and started a very large global discussion about the importance of not using single-use plastics. And that was a wonderful example of how powerful social media can be. But at the same time, raising awareness about an issue is not always the same thing as solving it. And that's why you have to consider the costs and benefits of the imagery you create when you're trying to create imagery for a conservation campaign. So if you find an animal who's struggling because of some anthropogenic issue, say a sea turtle with a straw up its nose, showing people that can definitely have an impact. However, forcing an animal to interact with you for the same goal is not justified because you don't know that your photo or video is going to have a huge impact. No one with a camera can say for certain at the end of the day that the photos they collected are going to have a huge impact. It's really a gamble. Even if your photo is evocative, it depends on so many different factors, whether it's going to go viral on social media. I think it's safe to say that no animal should be disturbed to create conservation content. And the reason I say that is because there are countless examples of photos and videos that made a huge difference that did not require the disturbance of wildlife. So how can you do it right? How can you go out and take photos of wild animals without causing them any stress or other adverse impacts? In order to learn firsthand how to ethically photograph wild animals, Roth shadowed professional wildlife photographer Daniel Dietrich on an excursion in Northern California's Point Reyes National Seashore, about 40 miles northwest of San Francisco. When I went out with Daniel, it was definitely an eye-opening experience. He asked me to be there at like the crack of dawn. <laughs> And I was not used to waking up that early. So we met up at like 6, 6 30 a.m., get in this car, and we just started waiting by this uh, riverbank for these otters because I really wanted to see otters. I'd never seen a river otter. And I see nothing. I just see an empty, an empty river and some birds. And I really don't know what he's looking at. But having a trained eye and understanding the behaviors of these animals really allowed him to find them and not disturb them. So he happened to know that around this time every day, um, one of the otters would come out in search of food. And sure enough, one of these otters like just emerges out of the grass and um, starts searching for food. And it was uh, like, it was like magic to me. I'm like, how does he know this? And the reality is he just understands the behavior of these animals so well. And that was so instrumental for him to get access to these animals. And I think the reason that this works for him is because he takes such, he goes to such great lengths to make sure they don't know about him. See, he knows everything about them, but they don't know anything about him. He, we were pretty far away from the river otter that we were photographing and he whispers the, almost everything. And he just takes all these steps to kind of remain hidden. And I had never done this before. So at one point we were looking at a bunch of elk and I was like, oh, oh my God. And like they all turned around and walked away because I <laughs> was loud. And he explained to me like why that is a problem, because if they see you, they're just going to leave. They don't want to be near you. They don't want to be stared at. Then they're worrying about what I'm going to do. And that's why he goes to such great lengths to just kind of remain out of sight so they don't hear him. And it was just so highly effective. We saw so many animals that I've never seen. And it was really just because he was so quiet, stayed far away and knew where to look. And he also scheduled our tour in a way that just coincided with when these animals would naturally be out in the wild. Like we never went and found a sleeping animal or an animal who was engaged in a behavior that we could disturb. It was perfectly orchestrated so that we had the least amount of impact on the animals possible. And now when I go out, I take those things to heart. It's definitely not easy and takes a lot longer and has no guarantee of success. But at the end of the day, you feel a lot better about what you did. You really just took photos and left footprints. That's like he's really gives meaning to that term. Susie Esterhaus is an internationally renowned, award-winning wildlife photographer. Her professional career began about 15 years ago, but she says that she's been taking photos of animals since she was about six years old and has always aspired to be a wildlife photographer. Still, even she made some mistakes early in her career. 
You know, I think when all of us start, we accidentally scare animals. Um, And hopefully if we, I, I was a kid who was incredibly compassionate. I was very, very sensitive. I was bullied at school. I really gravitated towards animals and kindness. And so it sort of came naturally to me. And so when I did in those early days, if I felt that I had spooked an animal, I keyed into it pretty quickly. And I think that probably came from my innate love of observing wildlife and and just really sort of keying into their behavior. But when I did accidentally do it, because we all in the beginning do it where, you know, uh, an animal looks at you bug eyed and then runs away, um, I felt very bad and guilty for for doing it. So I had this sort of connection to that from a very young age. But I would be completely lying if I said that, you know, I I have a flawless records record. We all accidentally do things. There have always been photographers as concerned with the well-being of their animal subjects as they are with getting a good shot, Esther Haas says, but she sees newer generations of photographers becoming increasingly concerned with the ethics of wildlife photography. For her, understanding the habits and behaviors of the species being photographed is one of the most important skills for an ethical wildlife photographer to develop. I think that the younger generations are more keyed into it than some of the people that were in this, like in the generations before me. However, having said that, there have always been people that, you know, operated completely ethically. And I think that one of the things when I was first starting out, I had this opportunity to work with uh, some some people that are mentors to me to this day. It was a, a BBC uh, big cat film crew. And I was an unofficial apprentice kind of situation with them for a few different shoots in East Africa. And one of the things that they really taught me is that ability to know when you're stressing an animal out, because sometimes it's actually not that obvious. Obviously, if an animal gives you a bug-eyed look and then runs away, that's pretty obvious. But that's usually, when an animal does that, they've actually been stressed for a while prior to that, animals aren't always going to run away immediately when they're stressed. They're they're probably gonna try to carry on what they're doing first. And so working with Owen and Amanda at a very young age, when I was around um, 19 years old, it really gave me the ability to read animals' behavior. And I was always very interested in that. As a kid, I spent long, long hours doing these long observation journals of animals' behavior. In, in the yard and in nature reserves and whatnot. So it always fascinated me and it was always the part of wildlife photography that I love the most. So for me, it was it came very naturally to key into that. But then working with them, it really taught me, you know, how to read their their really fine, subtle movements and expressions and know if if they're relaxed um, with you or not. And this is not, incidentally, this is not the same for every species. It's very different for, for each species, and it can also be different for each individual animal. But particularly across species, there are major differences. And the one that I like to use all the time as an example to people is, you know, lions, when they're relaxed and you know, happy and content, they yawn often. You know, that's sort of the typical scene of a of a lazy lion with a full belly and um, super happy and content and yawns. A grizzly bear, if they yawn, uh, they're usually going to do it when they're looking at you and when they're sitting upright. And the yawn is actually a sign of stress. And so it can be a precursor to them charging you, but they yawn when they're uncomfortable and stressed out. It usually comes before the chuff, which is like a warning they make with their mouth. But but the the yawn is something to key into that the animal is not comfortable in your presence with a grizzly bear. So, you know, the, the importance of knowing your subject is always something that I try to impart on people. When I go into these really long projects, I research my subjects ahead of time and I read everything I can about their behavior so that I can I can know a bit about this animal before I get on the ground with it, so to speak. As important as it is to understand the species you're shooting, Esther Haas says there are some more universal behaviors that provide clues as to how an animal is reacting to the presence of a human. 
And being able to read these kinds of clues will not only benefit the animal, but the quality of the photos you're taking as well. There's definitely some universal ones. Like one of the classic ones that is, um, is the animal stopping their behavior? Essentially, are they stopping what they were doing before you showed up? So you're walking up on an animal, hopefully very slowly and gently, um, or, you know, if you're driving, you're driving very slowly, gently. Um, and you come upon an animal and they stop what they're doing. Let's say you come upon an animal grazing, a deer grazing, and they stop what they're doing and um, they look at you. If they go back to grazing immediately, they're, you, that's a relaxed animal. If they stop grazing and watch you and they're not going back to grazing, that's an animal that's uncomfortable with your presence. And that means you're a little too close. So you back up, you certainly don't get closer, but you back up and take a few steps back to see if they can restart what they were doing, their natural behavior before you walked up. And then, they, and then they're relaxed. And, and this is something that is good for the animal, right? First and foremost, it's the animal's welfare and it's good for the animal because let's face it, these animals have a hard time making a living now. Um, with all the things that we throw at them. I mean, first of all, there's like survival of the fittest, right? They've got to worry about predators, but then they also have to worry about us. You know, and we're generally, you know, at a minimum, sometimes annoying the hell out of them, hell out of them. And at, at a max, maybe we're downright harassing them. And so they've got a lot to worry about. There's, got, there's a lot of pressure on their shoulders. So the animal's welfare is important, obviously, but also your photography is going to be much better if you can get natural behavior because nobody likes a portfolio of animals staring at you with a bug-eyed look. You know, that those are easy photos to get and they're not very unique. What people love is behavior. Um, and, you know, that's particularly what I gravitate to this, you know, since I specialize in baby animals, I like to do that really very intimate, very almost private behavior between mothers and their youngs, the, the young, the, you know, the real tender, tender moments that you wouldn't necessarily see as a person watching them unless they were incredibly comfortable with your presence. Esther Hawes is also adamantly opposed to the idea that raising public awareness of the need for wildlife conservation justifies unethical behaviors towards animals by photographers. She says that patience is perhaps the most important value of the ethical wildlife photographer, and that many folks who try to justify unethical photography are simply trying to excuse the fact that they don't want to take the time to do it right. Esther Haas herself once spent more than two weeks getting a jackal family used to her presence before taking a single photo of them. I've heard that argument before with wildlife photographers that have photographed at game farms. And, um, and it's, just, it's just flat out not a valid argument. This is like the, the concept of the sacrifice of the individual for the welfare, welfare of the species. And, um, and, you know, what's also the big thing is, is that people who say that they may not realize the scale of, of what these things are occurring on. You know, these particularly now with the selfies, it's happening to gibbons in Southeast Asia, sloths in South America, lion cubs in South Africa. It, it's it's never ending. It's on a absolutely huge global scale. So um, my response to that is that it's total BS. I think a lot of this comes down to when you're dealing with amateur photographers in particular, and sometimes pros, um, some of the, the unethical stuff really occurs when people don't want to take the time that it takes to get really unique, beautiful imagery. And one of the things that, you know, I've had to do because I specialize in baby animals, um, very early on, I learned that what I want to do requires incredible patience, which my mom always laughs at because apparently I'm not very patient in my personal life, but I am incredibly patient in the field. And I think it's just because I love being in nature so much and I do feel so present. And so for me, sitting there watching an animal sleep for 14 hours is, you, I'm not going to lie, yeah, it's sometimes slow. But I get to sit there with the animal, um, be in its presence, listen to the birds, feel the wind against my face. I just absolutely love being in nature. So it, it comes quite easily. It's trying at times for sure. You know, I mean, some of the things that I do require um, habituating animals that are not used to human presence which basically means there's a shy animal and I've got to get them used to me. And so my 
I think my record with that is a jackal family that I had to, they were shy when I started with them. And so I had to habituate them to my presence. So what I did is I got my vehicle a little bit closer to them every day. I started off at a very long distance away. It took me 17 days until I got my first photo. So that's 17 days, sunrise to sunset, 14 hours a day, sitting there and getting them used to me and not getting a single photo. It takes an incredible amount of patience to do that. But, and you know, the and these aren't, you know, it's not like we're laying in the Ritz Carlton for 17 days. These aren't, you know, really comfortable conditions. In that situation, I was in a hot cramped car. I was peeing in water bottles. I mean, it's it's not a sexy, glamorous job by any means. But at the end of this time, because I got this family used to me and they carried out their lives around me. And in the end, it was as, as if I disappeared, which is always my goal. And um, I stayed with them for five months and got incredible photos. Um, but that patience, in order to sort of disappear and become part of their landscape, was this, which is essentially what happens when an animal's used to you, you become just like a boulder in their habitat. They just ignore you and act like you're not there, which to me is always the ultimate end goal. But to get there, it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. And some people just aren't willing to put that time in. As she mentioned, Esther Haas specializes in photographing baby animals. For that in particular, patience is not only a best practice for ensuring the well-being of the animals, but for getting the very best photos possible. Uh, it's a best practice for ethical wildlife photography, and it's also how you're going to get unique imagery, you know, and people are like, oh, you know, they look at my stuff and they're like, wow, you know, you're really lucky you got to do a, a wild tiger den or, you know, a leopard family in Africa. And yeah, I am incredibly lucky and I'm incredibly blessed, but I also worked really hard for it. And a lot of that was patience, you know, being on call, waiting for a birth for 18 months. And then when I, you know, when I finally get there, trying to find the den, sitting with the tiger family in 115 degree heat for 11 days, they vanish and I see absolutely nothing and then pick up with them again. So these really very long trying periods, though, are how we get really unique imagery and how we can create something really special that nobody else has. So it's it's kind of a win win because we we number one where you're treating the animal with kindness and respect and we're not affecting their lives in a, in a very negative way. And number two, we're getting um, very unique gifts out of it. We're getting these, these incredible images that we wouldn't be able to get without it. There are some other ethical guidelines Esther Haas feels like any aspiring wildlife photographer should know. One of the things is first going back to the beginning, you always want to okay, I'm gonna set out and I'm gonna go after this subject. Um, you wanna educate yourself about that subject. Um, and, and like I said, learn everything you can about their behavior in the wild. That's very easy to do these days. There's so much information on the internet. I read, when I go into a story, I will read the books. I order the books that I can about the animal that, is, that have been done. I will read scientific studies. A lot of those are posted online. I'll contact experts that have studied the animal and I will just try to learn everything I possibly can about them. Then when I get on the ground, I will, if I'm working alone, I will just try to spend a lot of time observing the animal on my own. I'm very, very patient in the beginning, very gentle. Those beginning days are really important for, um, or, or it can just be moments. It doesn't have to be days, but the beginning is very important because the animal is trying to decide if they can trust you or not. And they're gonna make a judgment call. And, um, and one of the things about trust with an animal is that you can build a relationship of trust, but if you break that, if you violate that, it's really hard to get it back. So once an animal starts trusting you, it's a very vulnerable relationship that you have to really cherish and be careful of. And this is even animals that are already habituated to people. Even some of the most habituated animals, when you first approach them, they've seen a million people, but they just look at you and check you out to make sure you're not doing anything unusual. And so it's, it's very important to 
in the beginning to treat those moments um, with with great respect, whether they're minutes or hours or days. Um, those first those first moments being with the animal are really important. And um, if I'm working with a guide, you know, sometimes I do my projects solo. Other times I'll work with a local guide and tracker. Um, I just uh, did it, finished a leopard family. Well, I'm actually still working on it and have been working on it for two years where I, um, I followed a leopard mom and her cubs, her newborn cubs, which is a notoriously uh, very sensitive situation because leopards are very, very good at hiding their cubs and very elusive about where they've put their newborns. And this female was very habituated to begin with, um, but I wanted to also work with her in the best way possible. And so I worked, I hired a guide and tracker to be there with me. Um, and this guy, you know, he'd been at this Tubu tree camp for a really, really long time. And he's known this female since she was two months old. So he knows her behavior. So often by finding someone who either knows the species or knows the individual that you can work with, they will sort of make sure that you're working in a way that you're not going to harass the animal, threaten them, make, make them feel uncomfortable. And so by being with this tracker, um, he knew her behavior. And so it made it a little easier for me um, in terms of making sure that we didn't do anything that upset her because I knew he was the expert. He just knew better than anyone. Um, so yeah, sometimes bringing in a team. And then the other thing too is in the, in the initial approach, whether you're on foot or a vehicle, one of the things is all animals like slow, gentle movements. There are no animals on the planet that like it when people move quickly or make sudden movements with their, with their arms. So um, one of the things that, and I had this in the beginning, I mean, this, this, and sometimes I get so excited, I still have to remind myself, okay, chill out, chill out. But particularly in the beginning, when you, you're so excited to see an animal that, you know, you take the camera and you put it up real fast and you move your arm real fast to take a photo. And this can often be a threatening gesture. And, and these are very benign creatures that are threatened by this, like harbor seals particularly hate this. That, and that actually comes back from when they were shot by the sealers. Um, and so that that movement of your arm has um, has really been ingrained in them for, as something to be afraid of. And so anyway, keep the movements very slow, very gentle. Um, and then the other thing is with some animals, they really pick up on your energy. They feel your vibe. So one of the things in my career, I lead photo tours and one of the place that it, places that I take people is to swim with humpback whales in Tonga. And we photograph them underwater. And it's, and it's absolutely one of the greatest wildlife experiences on the planet. But one of the things that I will tell my clients before we get in the water is do your very best to leave your jitters and your anxiety and excitement on the boat. Try very hard not to bring it in the water with you. And that's, you know, take some deep breaths, calm, um, and try to be calm. And if you find yourself feeling anxious or scared about the open water in the water with the whales, try to breathe your way out of it because whales will pick up on nervous energy. They don't like it. I've had whales turn around and swim away, previously friendly whales turn around and swim away because they didn't like someone's energy. Um, it's almost like a predatory vibe, I think, that they feel. And so I work on my energy as well, particularly with moms and babies, because they are so sensitive to any kind of danger, any predator. If you think about these animals in the wild, they're just like people. So human moms, after they give birth, you know, they're in that sort of infant stage where they're they're nesting, they're at home with their baby, and it's any anything tries to mess with their baby, and they're a total mama bear. These animals are no different than people, and so that's something that I also try to impart on on my clients is like, hey, you know, these animals are are human. They're they're like humans in the fact that they have personalities. They have good moods. They have bad moods. They have good days. They have bad days. And so trying to see them as individuals will also help you. And I think anybody, one thing that's a great, a really great lesson if someone wants to take the time is to try to work with one animal for more than an hour or more than a few hours. If there's an animal, you know, 
that's hanging out in your yard that you see all the time and you're interested in photographing it, we'll try to photograph it for days or, or weeks, because then we really start to read animal behavior. And once you know animal behavior in one species, it kind of begins to help you with, with other species as well as you go along. As for how much distance you should keep between you and your subject? It's a very difficult question to answer because it completely depends on the location, it depends on the species, and it depends on the individual. And it can also depend on the atmosphere and what's going on. So a great example is um, grizzly bears. With grizzly bears, there are some places where they have had so much conflict with people, whether it's from hunting or from just conflict with people that are living in areas where bears are and they're raiding garbage, they're getting into trouble all the time. Bears have really learned to fear people. Uh, you've got to stay really far away from those bears because those bears are, are very unpredictable and have had bad encounters with people and that's left a bad taste in their mouth. And so they are more likely to be threatening to you and also you're more likely to be threatening to them because they're just scared at the sight of you. Uh, you go across you know, an inlet from areas like that. And you can have bears that are protected in national parks. This is really common in Alaska. And they've never had a bad experience with a human. They totally chess people. And as a result, they're very predictable and they will walk right past you. And, and sometimes the best thing to do in a situation like that is to stay still. If you were it's, it's very, very difficult to make a generalized rule about any species. There's some ex exceptions like polar bears. Um, on foot, polar bears, you should always be 100 yards away because they uh, hunt people and they're very dangerous. Um, and also they're going to be scared at the sight of you potentially. Um, but it, it really depends on what's happening and how the animal's feeling. I've also had situations where I've been working with an animal for a long time. They're totally habituated. And then, you know, that animal's just having a bad day and doesn't want me around. And maybe, you know, this happened once with my leopard mom and we figured out what happened because one day we came upon her and she was just in a really grumpy mood. We could see it. And she instantly kind of looked up and her body kind of seized when we arrived and we thought, what's going on? Because this is a female that's just so relaxed. And then we found tracks um, that basically showed she was in a big fight with the neighboring female the night before. And so she was just on edge. She had a really bad night. And um, and so we just let her be. So it 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 really depends on on the animal. What I will say is that if you are coming up on an animal and they stop their natural behavior or they give you the bug-eyed look, you're too close. And that's pretty, that's, that's species wide. There's also animals that are more likely to let you get close than others. You know, deer are more likely to let you get close because they're again, used to people. Again, but it, it also it does go back to whether or not the animal is, is hunted as well. So, or has had a history of hunting as well. Sorry, there's no easy answer to that one. I think the general rule is, is watch the animal and see how they're responding to you being there. If you enjoy the Manga Bay Newscast, we ask that you please consider becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash manga bay. We're a nonprofit news outlet, so just a dollar or more per month helps us offset production costs and hosting fees. And supporters at the $10 a month level also get access to our members-only insider content articles at the website. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash mangabay to learn more and support the Mangabay Newscast. And don't forget you can subscribe to the Mangabay Newscast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, CastBox, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And of course you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. If you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash mangabay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at mangabay on both of those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Mangabay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. 
Talk to you again in two weeks.